Hello and welcome to the Walk Off. I'm Scott Belford, joined by our intern co-host, Joel Flam. Hey, Kami. And buddy, we watched the Home Run Derby yesterday. Teoscar Hernandez wearing the championship necklace by the end of that thing. And in my opinion, man, one of the more fun home run derbies in a long time. Format kind of helped, I think. Did you like the new format? I actually loved it. Yeah, I think um, it was nice. It, I, it came down to the wire, which I liked. Um, at the end, you were biting your nails mm. to see whether Bobby could do it with that. Like, it was down to the final um, out. And then he hit one that was over 425, which gave him another out. And you're like, oh my God, this could give him a chance. And then just one short. And I think it was too, still- just a more accurate representation of who was doing the best too. Like taking the top four out of eight instead of kind of the one versus one where you would, I know Very last true. year there were like last year, right? Like look at, look at Julio Rodriguez, like set records in that first round and then got eliminated because he was up against a guy that he just couldn't compete with, right? I, he was he was bagged. So I think I think it was a really fun new way of doing things, and uh, we're gonna think get it, right into it. But it helps with the like that they're not bagging themselves; they're not exhausted all the way through because at the end they're like able to just like oh, not swing at this one. Not there's an, a clock ticking down at the end. They just want to you to put your best swings on it at the beginning. They're just like, raw, raw. they're just going at it. And like Adolis yeah. is at the end of it. He's like, just consuming half the air in the building. He's- you know what I loved about it, Joel, is you could tell the guys who hadn't done it before, how exhausted they were in the first 90 seconds of doing it. When they call their first time out and they're like, Holy shit. You know, like Adolis, Hey Oscar. Like there were a few guys where you're like, Oh, it just kind of hit them. Like it just kind of clicked in their brain of like, oh my God, this is uh this is far more tiring than maybe they hadn't anticipated. But it was really cool. Teo didn't swing like Teo was kind of like more methodical. And I think that helped him find his groove because he like started and he wasn't going very well. And then in that, like after the timeout, and the bonus just, like, round was, is what saved yeah. him, especially in round one there. Cause he was just able to like slow down, pick his pitch, take a breath. There wasn't the, um, without the clock, right. There isn't that panic that, that added anxiety when you're swinging. And I think that that really played to Tay Oscar's strengths. Oh yeah. And, and, and destroyed Pete, like Pete didn't even show up, which I was shocked. Like that's uh Yeah. And you could tell that the panic was affecting the way Pete was swinging too, because when he did not get off to a good start in that first minute, and I think he was sitting at two home runs in the first minute, he was just like, you could tell that there was that extra anxiety and he wasn't, he wasn't himself anyways. Yeah. Yeah. So this is mailbag. We do this every single Tuesday. It's a Monday morning mailbag on a Tuesday afternoon. We comb through all of your interaction throughout the week. You can always reach out on Twitter, a walk off podcast on Instagram, the walk off podcast. If you are a Patreon member, you get an automatic Patreon bump and get your comments and questions on without a second thought. We have a few of those today. And then uh, YouTube, you can absolutely drop your comments on YouTube and we will comb through that. I've got a couple from Discord as well today. And we're going to start with this because uh it's what everyone in baseball is talking about, Joel. James on Twitter reached out and it was literally like seconds after it happened. He goes, "Holy shit, guys. Did you see the singing of that national anthem? LOL. Chicks about to be the joke of baseball for the next week." I mean, might be longer than a week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Man, it was so bad that I literally started to question myself. Like halfway through, I was like, am I just like my ears don't hear good music anymore? Like, am I? This has got to be me. This can't be Major League Baseball who have given this anthem singing opportunity to this lady to just butcher it. It can't be Major League Baseball. And then, of course, by about three quarters of the way through, I was like, nope, it's Major League Baseball. It is for sure her. It is not me. Like, my wife was hilarious, dude. Taylor was just like, by the the three-quarter way mark, she's like, how did this slip through the cracks? How did they? She's like, they should have fucking auto-tuned her. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it was. It, it became the story of the Derby. Yeah. It was what was getting the highlights at the end. It wasn't really, they weren't talking about the Derby. They were like, the number one thing, let's get this off right off the bat. Let's talk about the uh, national anthem. And they like, I think on Sportsnet after they played it all the way. They just played it again. Yeah. You're going to listen to the national anthem horribly again. And it's like, I have a feeling she probably can sing. And maybe well, that was her first time in front of 45,000 people. Maybe her voice cracked and then it just wouldn't stop. Maybe it was like, you know, maybe sand, it was the right of- to, to steal a, a fear from Falco and replacements. She was in quicksand last night. <laughs> and then uh, Orlando Jones comes, he's like, yeah, man, quicksand, man, get it. And it's like, no, it's more metaphorical. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, it's like that we're not actually worried about quicksand on the field. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> but maybe that was the case because you're right. Grammy nominated four times Grammy nominated. Right. Like even when they said that, I was like, okay, they pulled out all the stops and then she started singing. And I was like, Oh, and there, it wasn't bad right off the top. And then there was that, like you said, a crack in the voice. And then that's when the quicksand comes in, right? She gets in her head and she just, it's the only thing I can think of. Cause that was honestly one of the worst anthems at a sports event I've ever heard sung. It made Fergie's like disaster look incredible. (laughs) I I go back to Roseanne's, but hers was intentionally bad. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that was like, I don't think that that's a good idea to do intentionally bad national anthems. You're probably not going to get the best reaction from the crowd that way. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a hell of a, way, of a way to start, and it instantly spread everywhere. Like I was, I was, uh, I, I tuned in about halfway through Alec Bohm. Mm-hmm. You know, I was uh, I was doing some work, and I tuned halfway through Alec Bohm, and then Rachel, she sends me a message, and it's the national anthem, and yeah. I'm just like, and I know she she was driving. So yeah. that had gotten around to her while she was driving. And then she's like, sends it to me. And I'm like, well, this is, this is going around the world right now. My phone was blowing up from friends who aren't big baseball fans. Like that is like, that was the reach, right? Like it, it became, if you were just a sports fan, it had reached outside of baseball, Twitter, outside of baseball, Facebook, all of the, the social platforms and had reached sports fandom, which is, Whenever it's a negative thing, that's always such a hard one to take, right? Where you're like, well, maybe just maybe it's just the joke amongst baseball fans. No, nope, unfortunately, this one got all the way out. <laughs> it's it's funny too because like half the participants are Dominican, right? So mm-hmm. they're just sitting there and they're like, Don't is she gonna sing our anthem after this? <laughs> Dude, you know who uh and I don't know if you saw him um who was the snl guy that was uh doing the oh my god i'm sorry i should have looked this up beforehand anyways the guy who did all the announcing for the participants in the derby Mm -hmm. man he was incredible like Uh, Marcelo Hernandez. I can't believe hmm. I couldn't remember that. I was remembering Hernandez, and I all I could think was Tay Oscar. Tay, like, yeah. What is his name? Yes, Marcelo. But man, he, so his mom is Cuban and his dad is Dominican, and of course he's on SNL and hilarious. But he does that like very uh latin accent where you can really like from santiago dominicano you know Mm. like it was just like so great and just man and gunner henderson's was so funny too he's like this guy looks like he plays lacrosse but is actually one of the greatest baseball players in the game today right like (laughs) just like just little jokes to go with it right it was so funny man and he didn't no hiccups no nothing like just the complete opposite of the national anthem. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and that's we, we need that. We need um <clears throat> we need the ability to transition the the derby and the all-star game into being 
if there's no you know stakes especially for mm-hmm. the all-star game then we've got to have as much fun as possible mic yeah. up the players and just you know let's just really enjoy it let's have some laughs let's bring some people to a baseball game where the best players in the world are getting together and just enjoying the game for one night right like I really, and Grounds Crew, go ahead and and drop your comments below here. What did you think of this year's home run derby? Because I give it like 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10. Like it it is, I enjoyed it so thoroughly and I enjoyed it front to back. I mean, even the negative parts, like the anthem, I loved it to death. It was hilarious. You know, like. The one thing is I would hope that they would be able to get some, some more of the top um, my friends were like, is this the middleweight home run derby? Is there a heavyweight home run derby that comes after? Because like the biggest guy you had there was, I think was probably Pete Gunner, six, four, but he's lean. You know, yeah. it's like, it, it felt Adolis, like Adolis was a, quite a presence. Oh yeah. He's six, one though. Right. Where mm-hmm. you still want, like, you still looking for your Stantons, your Schwarbers, your, your Vlad, judges. your judges, yeah. your, even an O'Neill Cruz and Ellie mm-hmm. Della Cruz, right. Mm-hmm. The guys who have the opportunity to put 500 feet on the board. I think is very in, in you. Want, I want that. I want to see 500 feet. Juice the balls, juice the damn balls, please. Like just make these balls. Like I want to see guys who hit normally, you know, they have balls over the last five years that have been different about 50 feet on exit below, like standard exit below. This ball goes 380. This ball goes 425. Give me the 425 balls, yeah. please. Because I want to see those distances. I want to see. We all do. Team. And for the Derby, who gives a shit? So. <laughs> okay, moving on here. Uh, going back to Twitter. So Mike wrote a, a question here and he said on today's JD Bunkus show, Jeff Blair had said he doesn't see the Jays trading bow at the deadline because they want to sell tickets this year. I have to say, I was surprised to hear that as I cannot see a world where having bow on the team will make a big difference on a last place team and nothing to play for. He also, uh, he had also mentioned that it's er- easier to trade position players in the off season. I would say keeping Bo on this last place team in the event that maybe they sell a few more tickets is terrible management of the roster. Bo is historically at his best in August and September. Very true. Uh, and contending teams know this and will have a shot at a World Series with him, not just one if they get him in the off season. Uh, if he's not re-signing, we need to sell him now. Thoughts? I have to agree with Mike on this one where I don't know if keeping Bo is going to sell more tickets. And I would love to hear from you, the grounds crew. Like, if you're in Toronto, uh, are you going to games because Bo Bichette is in the lineup? I'm kind of at the point, like, and I've gone to plenty of games since getting here. Bo doesn't really move the needle for me right now. Not that I don't love Bo Bichette, and I remember last year, it would have been something that brought me to games. Like, when Bo is at his best, he absolutely is a draw. But we haven't seen it this season. And he does make a very good point about, you know, he has a history of getting hot at the end of the year. And if you can somehow spin that into just a lit, slightly higher prospect and MLB piece coming back or whatever it may be, I say you got to do it because this year's this year's done. Where are you at, Joel, on Bo Bichette and the likelihood that they hang on to him all season long? The reason makes no sense. Um, I'm like the biggest Bo Bichette fan there is. I do tons of Bo Bichette solo videos on TikTok. Like I'll, you know, every 10 videos I do, it's just like, I love Bo Bichette is the 10th for no reason. Mm-hmm. So um, it doesn't move the needle for me, right? Like he's not getting me to show up to the ballpark and I love him that much. So I know that that's just a kind of a ridiculous reason. Um, I think the hope would be that you would see him get hot over his historically hot months. Thus, mm-hmm jacking up his value when you do trade him i feel like there has to be more value though in in having two runs yeah with a player 
You know, I feel like that there's more value there. Um, and let's face it, dude. I actually worry more about Bo's, Bo's value decreasing more than it already has. I think there's still a world where you can kind of spin it of, yes, he's had a bad season, but a, a change of scenery and his history of getting hot at the end of the season could still really come into play here. And then on top of it, you've got a full another season. So you've got two kicks of the can with Bo Bichette before he goes to free agency. I think that's a far more likely sales pitch than crossing your fingers in hopes that he gets hot with the Blue Jays in August and September. And then what if he doesn't, then what are you selling? Mm -hmm. And then you, the commodities in an all time low and, and it, it's, it's a situation where the, the Jays front office doesn't sell high. They don't sell high. They sell low and they'll get to a point where the commodity is low and they're like, it's too low. Mm hmm and then it never, it may not dig itself out. They're like, oh no, no, you're really, really good. Yeah, yeah, but you're not on the team anymore. He's he's gone. He doesn't play for us anymore. His contract expired. Mm -hmm. He's playing for another team now. Oh no, we'll just wait for him to come around. Like uh, the, the, pulling the, I hate it. He's my guy. I want to build around Bo Bichette. I still do. I still believe in his bat. I believe in him. I just believe that this is a player who has no enthusiasm for the team that he's on. He knows he's a smart baseball player. He knows that this team wasn't contending in the off season. I think the off season he's sitting there, he's watching, he goes, Nope, not contending this year. I don't feel it. I have been, I've played. I you've, you've killed the love of baseball in me. Congratulations. I've had it since I was born. It's literally in my blood. And now I don't want to come to the ballpark and I don't want to perform. And you don't know if these injuries are real. And in this scenario, too, if Bo Bichette has already made his mind up that he is not going to resign in Toronto, he is hitting free agency no matter what, and he's going to the highest bidder, then what are we even fucking talking about here? You have to move him. You have to move him. And if you're not going to move him now, when are you moving him? In the off season? You're going to, like, I, I have hope, Vladdy returns in some form and right now vladdy's value is far higher than bo's so i i, I mean i'm gonna put bo in the same uh, vladdy in the same category here if vladdy has decided he's not returning he too has to be moved however i do think that there is a world where vladdy would come back i do think that there is a scenario where his heart is still in toronto perhaps more than bo Bichette's is and and not to lean on the yeah he was born in Canada even though he was raised in the Dominican Republic but I do think there is a little bit of truth to that that he's comfortable in Canada he's comfortable in Toronto and if they're going to give him equivalent money and I mean that's obviously the big asterisk on this if they're going to give him equivalent money to whatever other organization out there is after him I think he would stay in Toronto and I I don't feel the same way about Bo Bichette. Now, th there's a few things there that I do want to point out. I did say feel. I know nothing. I know shit all about where Bo Bichette and Vladimir Guerrero's hearts and heads are at when it comes to the Toronto Blue Jays. I do. I know where their heads are at. Um, uh, uh, Vladdy's head is uh, back when Teo used to be on the team. That's the jersey <laughs> he was wearing at the All-Star game. Yes. That's where his head's at. His head is where the game was fun. And he was with his friends and he loved to play the game. That's where his head is. That's why he stands next to Soto when he goes to the mm -hmm. all-star game. He goes and he, the, the people who don't think that Vladdy plays with this and not with like, no offense. He doesn't yeah. play with this. He's yeah. not using his brain out there. He's not the smartest guy on the baseball field. He's not really tuned into moments. He gets picked off. He's one of the worst runners you've ever seen. What is he? Passion. Fire, yeah. fuel, loving to smash that ball and be around guys that make him feel the game the way that Latin Americans love the game. And there's lots of guys that there's lots of examples of guys just like that on winning teams. Right. But what you need is to build a crew around him that fits in with what they're trying to do. And unfortunately, this front office has not built a cast around Vladdy that that is going to get the best out of him, that's going to get the best out of Bo, that's going to get the best out of this entire team. I mean, it, it, the team is dead for a reason.
And it all lies at the feet of Ross Atkins and and I'm sure it's arguable here, but Mark Shapiro. So on that, we are going to get to our last Twitter comment here before we move on to Patreon. And it's Trevor reached out and said, well, the front office chase, uh, well, the front office chose not to extend Teo, but we did get a nice minor league reliever named Swanson for his walk year and an Alberta kid that's a lotto ticket. Incredible, the front office spent $49 million AAV, new money adding and renewing players this offseason, and we are dog shit. KK, IKF, Vogelbach, JT, Y-Rod, plus green option. Um, tough to argue with pretty much any of that. I, I will say that with Tay Oscar being traded on an expiring contract for Eric Swanson, it made a lot more sense the year it happened. Swanson had an incredible season with the Blue Jays was that back end of the bullpen piece we really needed. That said, looking back now, I kind of don't understand why they didn't just go get him in free agency this year. <laughs> like, I like, don't understand why they, they didn't re-sign him after the 122 RBI year. Just here's six years. You get 120 RBIs behind Vladdy. He's going to be here for a long time. Just and yes, years. hindsight's twenty twenty. Like Joel, let's let's it's, take our it's, foot off the. I, it was I, like it's it's hindsight for a lot of people. For me, it was just like obvious in the moment sight and just absolute physical explosion when we made those moves. Like, you have every, never been more right about a take. I like I like. Listen, we're all Blue Jays and baseball fans here. I think everyone watching and the two of us included can say yeah we've we've all had terrible takes but mm-hmm. your belief in tay oscar definitely not one of them your your take your belief in tay oscar actually um it annoys me joel how right you were on this because <laughs> now here i am like three years later being like fuck maybe we should have just signed tay oscar why did we go down this road like I don't you know all star silver slugger. Like what, what, what do we know? Understand what values are like left fielder, all star silver slugger. His defense is terrible. Perfect. His defense could have been worse. Yeah. His defense could have been worse. He could have made an error every five games. I don't give a shit about goddamn outfield errors. I don't, I just don't, I give about, I, I care about them at second base and shortstop. I don't care about the ball that bounces through you every 30 or so games out in left or right field. Schneider, it happened to him all the time at the beginning of the year, and we didn't mm-hmm. crucify him. We crucified Teo for one game in Detroit. There was one yeah. game in Detroit, a ball got by him, and we thought that he was a bad baseball player. And I just, I go back to Robbie Ray in Seattle and coming into town, and he hits two bombs. And he's got, what, four or five RBIs that game, and he has the bases loaded, mm-hmm. and, uh, and they bean him. They throw at his head with the bases loaded. Talk about terrified of what a guy could do eight nine rbis set the record for single season post postseason rbis and they threw at his head with the bases loaded mm-hmm. you know talk about respect that was it wasn't a slip they threw at his head with the bases loaded, and we lost that game <laughs> we yeah. lost that game and then blew up the entire t of everything that the blue jays were our soul was gone our identity was gone everything was gone because we lost a singular weird baseball game where a ball fell in on the outfield ball fell in between a center fielder and a a shortstop. It is so wild. What that game did to this front office. It broke them. It broke them. Broke them. Completely broke them. Let's touch on uh, their understanding of how the game was played. And let's touch on this last half of the comment here where $49 million was spent this off season of new money uh, to go Double down on KK, IKF, Vogelbach, Turner, Yrod, and the green option. So there, there, there. Now I will say there are some, there are some good signings in there. I love the Yariel signing, especially long term. And you know what? If you can wind up, even if he winds up being a fifth starter with a four point two five ERA that only gets through five innings. For six million dollars a year, I mean that's about as good of a bargain as you're going to find. It, and it I, think, a, I think I think Yariel's ceiling is higher than that, Joel. 
Yeah, he's. Um, I've heard a lot of talk about this new type of reliever that we may see in the in the next few years, which is a, a kind of a bulk reliever, mm-hmm. somebody who's able to pitch two innings two to three times a week, right? Like give you six innings, but give you one less pitching change on a transitions transitioning to the bullpen. You go six from your starter. Uh, Yariel comes in seven eight closer right like it seems like i think he can be a starter i think he can be a starter i i'm let's go starter let's see if this guy can be yes at at his peak this guy could be a a two three i know i i feel the same way and i don't want to for everyone who is rolling their eyes at that by the way i i'm well aware that there are going to be ups and downs in yariel's next year and a half right like it doesn't escape joel and i that he is brand new to major league baseball and there's going to be adjustments on the hitter sides and then he's going to need to readjust and all of this but like i i gotta agree with you joel like everything i've seen out of yariel it excites me i like how poised he is i like how he mixes his pitches he isn't quadrant um specific either You know, like the way he uses the entire strike zone is a beautiful thing Mm -hmm. that we don't see a lot of anymore because a lot of pitchers tend to just pick away at the outside and for good reason, right? Because it works if you're doing it well. He locates his 96 really well. He locates a 96. I I mean, so you know what? Credit on, on that one. Yariel was a good signing. But what Trevor is saying here really does hit home for me because you start looking at where they were investing their money and it made no sense outside of Yariel. You know, uh, Chad Green, it's tough to pick apart that option because I was pleased with how deep it made the bullpen feel at the time. But it's crazy how, you know, a couple of... A couple bad years, and this is what has happened, right? We had two bad years in Eric Swanson and Tim Meza. We had an injury at the back end of our bullpen in Jordan Romano, and now we're fucked. Mm-hmm. Now we're fucked. You, you, you're, you're so reliant on those arms to close out your games, and they, they, they and go this isn't them. necessarily like. Do you blame the front office on that? Because yeah. I I can't. Yes. I, Yes. My problem is, Joel, I can't see how another team would lose three of their top high leverage relievers and be any better off. But um, I would I would argue that that they put their relievers into a tough position where we needed them overly. Oh, listen, over usage is a good point. Right. Like over usage obviously is something that you're like, oh, every night we're we're depending on these guys. Bad starts. You know, and and um, Swanson, man, I don't. I, and it does come back down to I. I love what you're saying, offense, right? Yeah. Oh. Because if you got to be so fine, you're this constantly is, using your high leverage guys. The, the, the I made the point on on long toss that offense is really the only we we got rid of offense. Offense makes everything better. It makes everything better. It makes your pitching better because your pitchers can go longer. They have more room to work with. They feel more confident. They can walk this guy and pitch to this guy. Strategy comes into play because there's, we're up three. Oh, let's throw more fastballs. Let's, let's confidently get ahead of the count. Let's make sure that we're getting into Oh, one counts here because we want to stay aggressive. We want to keep our pitch count low. Your entire mentality shifts when you're up eight and you get to bring in low leverage guy to finish off the game. Like mm-hmm. you need more of those. You need to finish more games where you're like, ah, it doesn't matter if this guy comes out and gives up three. It doesn't matter. We're up seven. Like we're, we're fine here. So there's, you need that. You need that comfort. You need that ability to feel comfortable while you play, to be up and be, smooth and, and relaxed and, and, and calm. And, and it leads to everybody holding the ball that much harder, gripping the bat that much harder, trying that much harder. The, the, the game is, is explosive moments, but you have to be so poised. You have to be so Zen in your mentality when you approach this stuff, because I swear just Bo goes up to the plate and he's like, we're not going to win today. We're not going to win today. Can't hit. No, he can't hit. Goes to another team. Goes, oh, we're going to win today. He's going to hit. 
That's going to be it. That is literally going to be the difference in Bo succeeding. Is him just coming to the ballpark and going, we can win. We saw, I, I swear to God, that's it. And so, yeah, to, to lose, to lose three bullpen pieces is, is tough. And, and everybody's going to, especially your closer, your setup, man, your, your lefty specialist, you lose those pieces. But the fact that like, we haven't been able to build any relievers really like Nate is, is a, is a reliever out of this, like out of, it's his last chance. And it's like, why, why aren't there four or five more names that are up and consistent over the last seven years that are internally built instead of having to trade cl- uh, cleanup hitters for, for set up men who are good for one year and then whatever. Right. Like it's the, the, the fleetingness. Also it's the commodity understanding of a pitcher is a 50% shot of just exploding any given year. Well, not 50% every year, but 50% over the course of the career that they're just going to fall apart and you're, you're out, you lose them for 18 months. That's why, like, to me, I, with the, with the angels drafting only pitchers, it's like, I draft only hitters and I'd acquire pitchers. Pitchers are built up. Pitchers are cultivated. And I would just go hitter, 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 overload on hitter, and then acquire pitching, right? Acquire pitching because your hitters you're not taking on players that are like, oh, well, we got him. And for the next 18 months, he's, we don't know what he's worth. And then for another year, we'll find out what he's worth. Or, oh, we built him up for three years. And as soon as he got to the majors, he's out for 18 months. Build your commodities through, the, through hitters. And then acquire pitchers. This leads perfectly into our next question. So we're going to Patreon here, Brian Crawford. And of course, all the Patreon members a uh, a hearty tip of the hat your way thank you so much we do appreciate your patronage so brian crawford says question for mailbag what moves would you like the blue jays to make before the trade deadline focus on the farm system question mark bring in some mlb ready players question mark so i'll let you start here joel if if you are in charge of fixing the Toronto Blue Jays, where do you start this trade deadline? Front office. <laughs> Blow up the front office and I bring in a new front office that can try to convince what's left of this team that we can make a run with it. I don't think Vlad resigns with Atkins. I don't think Bo resigns with Atkins, right? And I want them. And it's like, that's ridiculous. You want to run it back with players who the first time were cheap and you could build around them a lot easier. And now you want to put money in those players who probably didn't get you where you needed to go. And you're going to trust in them again. It's just like, I think that you need an entire culture change. You need an identity change, right? That's what needs to happen here. It's not, I don't, I'm not mad at the players. I'm mad at everything that is put out there when it comes to the coaching. I don't think the coaching has been right. We have a young team. We're trying to build up a young team. Where's the veteran manager? That seems obvious. It just seems obvious. You've got a veteran manager. Bruce Bochy was sitting on his ass, just sitting on his ass, right? And we didn't think, hey, that's the type of mind to even out the analytical approach. Hey, let's take uh, Barrios out. And and, and, um, Bochy would just be like, don't uh, don't bring me that phone anymore. If uh, they're going to be telling me shit like that, we're going to keep. You know, real. Joel, who's sitting around doing nothing that I would absolutely love to see. Now, this is uh, this is a proposition that only works if the ideals and the direction within this Toronto Blue Jays front office changes. But I would love Joe Madden. I think mm-hmm. that he is a brilliant baseball mind. I think that he is the perfect mix of analytics and old school thinking. I think he's very open-minded when it comes to the new way of operating a baseball team. And I think he's a fun guy. So do you, do you think his entire ability to manage fell apart by going to Anaheim for a season when they're Anaheiming they're yes. in the middle of Anaheiming and trout is injured and, and this Rendon is why I did care. qualify it, Joel. I qualified it with the front office would have to change the internal direction that they are headed because I don't think Joe Madden fits with the... Well, his former GM is out there too. 
Yes, he is. Right? You bring Bloom in, you bring Madden yeah. in, and you reconstruct Tampa Bay's money saving penny pinching approach with, with money with, with money right with money hmm i i hmm. and I, listen i it's know that there's a lot of people in the AL East too there's a lot of red Sox fans who were fed up with chain bloom but i think bloom gets a lot of negativity thrown his way because his hands were tied by that ownership group hmm. you know like every he still managed to lock up Devers, who is literally turning. I mean, Devers might be a top five player in Major League Baseball. He's a Hall of Famer. He's a he's a Adrian Beltre like Hall yeah. of Famer. Not he's defense to happen. Yeah, but like the fact that he's a lefty smasher will probably put up close to five hundred home runs from third base. And uh, and. There was some some strains in that relationship before they got it done, too. Remember that they didn't sign Bogarts, right? They let him walk. And then there was this, this narrative that they were just going to let all of these top-end talents that were developed in-house walk because of the fact that there was this, this uh, Mookie Betts and Xander Bogarts kind of you know narrative going on of just... And he got it done, though. And and he, he got like bounced quickly. I think one of the issues was Trevor Story was it was a tough signing yeah. um, for Boston. He, he, the injury that he had right away, he was supposed to help them and, and was injured. And, and it's tough to get a player out of Colorado to you know sign them long term, expecting them to pr- produce what they did in Colorado in their twenties. But they're contenders right now. Yeah, they're 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 a contending baseball team. They absolutely and- are. That's a lot of his building. That's a lot of his team construction, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Duran, I think that's his pick. I think Cassis yeah. is his pick, right? So it's just like these are players, young players who come up, crack the league, make a difference. And yeah, I uh, to me, that seemed our regime is literally the regime that had the most opportunity to succeed that I've ever seen with this team. Like we had the potential four years ago with the money, the youth, the players who are already here and every, the fact that we have an entire nation behind us to build a damn dynasty and the, where we are now, we should be division champion world series, top two power ranking team. And we are a 20th ranked baseball club. And I feel like, um, I'm, I'm, a total identity shift needs to happen. And, and you know what, like, is there, is there a job that like, I just, you, you got to cut Shapiro off. Like I've always been the one to say cut off Shapiro. He doesn't love baseball the right way. I'm going to like say the meanest possible thing. That guy doesn't love baseball the right way when it comes to wanting to win and build a winning team. That's not where his focus is. His focus isn't winning a championship. It's not. It's just a hundred percent not. And so that's where it's got to go. You got to go- have a guy who doesn't sleep at night, who, who is just literally crazy about victory, who just wants to win more than anything and will do anything to win. I, I want that. I don't want somebody who takes pride in architecture. I just don't. I don't. And maybe care. this Rogers ownership group dude will do that. Maybe they will force Shapiro to bring in a guy with some some name cachet, you know, a guy who has done it, a, a, a Chain Bloom type, a, a Kim Ang perhaps. But to get a general manager of that ilk, there's going to need to be some contractual stipulations that allow them to do and operate baseball, this baseball organization, the way they see fit, right? This group think collaborative stuff. I mean, obviously there's a place for it in every organization. I think it is very important to hear everyone's voices and, and to take the knowledge from within your organization. But I do think having one guy where the buck stops here is important. And I also think that a general manager that is worth anything in this league would want that, would want autonomy, which is why Alex Anthopoulos left back in 2015. Like 
he was offered the general manager job, but he was offered the general manager job under the stipulation that you are Ross Atkins, right? This is handcuff me. Yeah. Handcuffed behind my back, blindfolded with a cigarette in my mouth and 10 people with guns in front of me. That's how he was asked to me. This is why Joel Bryan's question, although such a great question to ask, is so hard to answer because I'm in the same boat. I'm like, well, all the things I would like to see happen can't happen with Ross Atkins at the helm. No. Does this farm system need to improve? Uh, Greatly. I like I, I bring it back to the the moves that we made in the off season. We're talking about the forty five million that we spent. We were trying to get Otani. Mm-hmm. We were trying to get Otani. We were we thought we could get Otani. We spent half of free agency in in the deluded world the that show he was going to come here, right? You know, and then oh, what? Maybe he's not coming. Uh, who else who else is out there whoa scramble <laughs> city and it's just like and, and what did anthopolis do and, anthopolis at the beginning of the uh off season like i ain't going after shohei fuck that i'm the first guy to take myself out of shohei's sweepstakes i'm out give me chris sale give me chris sale and and give me jared kelenic for almost uh for two, two guys getting tommy john two tommy john pitchers right like like I'm i mean again hindsight guys. i know but still yeah Kellenic like, has I'm been gonna, great. You get Aaron Bummer. Like he goes out and he's like, I don't need that. I'm going to build up. My team is, my team isn't based off of getting Otani. Okay. Yeah. You guys are so, so many teams are, there's five teams going into this. If they don't get them, four teams are going to be, oh, what do we do this year? Right. And, and the, the lack of understanding that Spencer Horowitz was an, op, was a viable first baseman option. Right. And the fact that we went and we got Brandon Belt and we got Justin Turner and we got Joey Votto. We got a bunch of old sons of bitches to try mm-hmm. to fill a spot that we had filled internally. We had is filled internally for two years, probably three. It's filled internally. Just a guy who can just do that job better than the guys that we paid 10 to 15, 12 million a year at 38 to come in with no hamstrings, no ability to run. Let's bring this guy in. No, they've got no ability to field these guys that we bring mm-hmm. in. We, we spend eight times the amount, 10 times the amount. We have a 27-year-old first baseman who can pop a 380 on base and and is a lot more than we thought he was because we don't give him a chance. And it's it's that it's those types of things where you're you're spending big on commodities when you should have been getting a tail. It's just go get one tail. Tail would have done more movement than everybody that you named there. One mm-hmm. four-hole hitter behind Vladdy, giving him confidence from day one, making him happy to come to the ballpark. Would have just, we, we, you know, we'd probably still be fighting with 19 home runs and 60 RBIs from our four hole spot. Mm-hmm. But we're not. So it's, yeah, my, my move is is them. My move is them because I don't trust them with the, the deals that they will make. I don't trust them with bringing players back. I don't trust them with getting new players, uh, building assets, um, making players better that they do have. I don't trust them in anything. Zero. Mm-hmm. So that's, I don't, I don't get mad at the players or the management because it's all a construct of two guys who just don't understand baseball in 2024. Going to discord before we get to YouTube, Joy O'Turn table said that was the best home run derby since the one Vladdy lost despite hitting more dingers. But if the rounds had been three minutes, two minutes, one minute, I think it would have been a little less draggy. Still a great performance. That was fun. I pretty much agree with everything you said there. I think there'd be a way to almost do two minutes. One guy, two minutes, the next guy, two minutes back to the first guy, two minutes back to the second guy. Mm -hmm. So the breaks are kind of like... They're in there. And it's kind of like, oh, you put down this in your first two minutes? It's almost like... You have to counter kind of two times. It gets you, like it, then it keeps the pace up. Yeah, you don't need to have timeouts because you're just your your timeout comes from this guy hits now. You go two minutes, your timeout is now this guy hitting. It's not just yeah. let's we have commercial breaks and we have Gatorade dampening this moment breaks when we could just go two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, and, and not have that 
lull in between. Yeah. And I think it would be fun, uh, like less draggy, like he said. I mean, it, it, it was still a great home run derby. There were moments where you're like, oh, okay, let's get to the dingers here. But uh, yeah, I, I, I have to agree with you. Those the the two the two minute rounds going back and forth might be a fun way of doing it. Go on to YouTube here. These are some comments from Long Toss. Uh, both you and I were on that. To start with, I know uh, Scott Carter had a comment, and he was just like, Scott, I love you, but you were kind of monopolizing the time on the long toss there. And I do want to just say, I, number one, I do appreciate the constructive criticism. I'm not opening the floodgates here for you to guys to tell me all the things you hate about me, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I do apologize. I, I will give you a little idea of where my head is constantly at, which is I'm constantly in my own head worried that I'm not moving the ball around enough. So if I'm monopolizing the time, normally it's me just, I'm, I'm literally thinking while I'm talking to try and like pass the ball to the next guy. Anyways, I do appreciate it being pointed out and I will work on that. Um, there it is. I didn't notice. It. <laughs> I didn't notice it. Maybe, maybe, maybe Scott noticed it there yeah. at home. But I really okay. Well, I, I, I and it's, it's a tough it. situation because we were a little low on. Uh, there was on there's guests. four of us, yeah. so like I think sometimes you host more, mm -hmm. but in this situation, you were. I think you. I was paneling a, a bit. Yeah, yeah. right? Because you were pulling double duty because we didn't have that many panelists. So yeah. maybe it was kind of a little bit of, that's what Scott, I think, was kind of yeah. taking in, is that you were trying to, which is what you needed to do. I, It was a good episode. <laughs> I agree. It was a good episode. I had a lot of fun with it. Um, Chris94 said, and I know a lot of Sunday's episode, was talking about what we were just kind of touching on, right? Which was the front office and the direction of this team going forward. And and that's the thing. I know there were some people who were frustrated that we weren't concentrating on the now, but it's tough to concentrate on the now when the now sucks, right? Like it's, it's tough to be like, let's live in the moment when the moment is just a sinking ship to steal a line from Shea Hillenbrand, right? So yeah, I think- come home from school and like three bullies beat you up and you got a black eye and a crack over <laughs> your mouth. And your dad's like, tell me about your day. And you're like, can I tell, uh, 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 how about we talk about like when we move out of town and I like grow up and I go to college, let's talk yeah. about our, my future, right? I get good grades. Let's talk about something I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about, but I, I should <laughs> kick it or tomorrow yes. or the next day or, you know, that is the perfect comparable. So Chris <laughs> says, uh, I don't think Shapiro gets fired. Rogers, as far as we know, is happy with Shapiro's work, which I actually, uh, I echo that sentiment. I do think that Shapiro's job is fairly safe right now. He's like, I do, however, think that the coaching staff, front office and scouting staff will have changes. And I think in a lot of cases, it, it it's because of how vocal this fan base has become. We are sick of this front office, and I do think that it is starting to resonate with Rogers and this ownership group that changes need to be made because they just invested $350 million, right? A third of a billion into this new stadium upgrades. And the last thing that they want is those beautiful arcades they've built to not watch baseball in to sit empty, Joel. Yeah. So let's get a team in here that is at least middling enough where the people are going to come out. So I do have to yeah. agree with Chris on that. In fact, I know Jen, face painters that they need to employ the right? face painters in there to draw our have tears any faces on for to us. paint. Exactly. <laughs> the little blue tears right here. <laughs> and I know Jen brought it up and she was like, I, and I loved how she kind of, was so hesitant and hated doing it, but she's like, I will give credit to Shapiro in that he has got this ownership group to spend more money than they have ever spent before. And there is something to be said for that. Whether we like the way Shapiro operates a baseball team or not is, is another subject altogether. So there is a positive there. And like Joel and I were just talking about, if they can go out and get, an established general manager that will have some stipulations in their contract where Shapiro maybe is a little hand more hands off than he has been in this current regime. 
maybe there is a scenario where Mark Shapiro as the president isn't a bad thing. But I think that there needs to be stipulations for that to happen because he does like having his fingers in the pie. Yeah. I got to stop watching Moneyball. That's just what it is. I just got to stop yeah. watching Moneyball. Every time I watch Moneyball, it's just that goes in there. And I'm like, you watch him and you're like, what a chud. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I would, I would take the actor who portrayed Shapiro in Moneyball just, just to try him out. I, I don't think we notice a difference, to be completely honest. Yeah. The, the fake one, and he's just script, some, just write a script for him, and he comes out, and you know he can hit the lines. So, you know, why not? So this next comment's from Chucharu. Chucharu, by the way, has been with us for probably four years. He's a, a steady commenter. So always love hearing from Chooch. He says, great one, guys. And Jen, family stuff kept me away. Sorry to miss it live, but long toss was great and love the passion here. Honestly, I'm done with the Jays this year. Come trade deadline. Sportsnet Plus canceled and taking some time. Number one, I will read the rest of this comment, but I love that sentiment. You know, just being taking some time, taking, some, taking time. some time, you know. Yeah. So he I'm, says, we'll absolutely watch you guys and keep up with the headlines. And that's it. Sometimes just got to focus on other things when what you love just gives you pain. They literally need to trade everyone and fire all key parties. Like, oh, my God, the change this team needs. And then it's rebuild for five to seven years side. And I don't know if I 100% agree with trade everyone, but I do get the sentiment. The house needs to be clean, Joel. And I think that's where a lot of this fan base is at, where they're like, I, this line, man, it really struck a chord. Sometimes you just got to focus on the things. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to focus on other things when what you love just gives you pain. Man, that nails it. Like, that just nails it to me because I'm a masochist. I'm going to continue to take this pain. I can't help myself. Like, I, I just, you know, it's like rubbernecking on the highway. Like, I, I can't help it. I'm just going to. I, I. But so much respect to those of you who have the ability to be like, listen, I'm going to, like, start spending more time with my family because... The Blue Jays are killing me. <laughs> so it's uh, funny because like, I, uh, I guess I, you could say that I'm somebody who kind of like shoots out of my weight class, you know, I'm probably attracted to girls way out of my league. And with this ball club, it's like the team, the team is, it's, this is, this is, this is a personal indictment. I want people out there to know that this is me coming down on myself. Now that the team has come down and is more on my level, I'm not attracted to them anymore. <laughs> not attracted to them. Now that so, you could actually hook up with this team, you're like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> and so I go and I look at myself in the mirror and it's like, I need to improve myself is what I'm hearing from this, right? Like I need to go out and I need to make myself better yeah, so that they can in turn make themselves better. And then maybe we can find... Ourselves. I got to get more active and start eating yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't love someone else until I love me first. Right. <laughs> it's what that feels like. And I'm, I can echo that sentiment. I, I this is it. actually a great place to plug baseball town. So if you are a blue Jays fan in need of therapy, all right, we're going to do a group therapy session this Thursday. Baseball Town, come on down to the Comedy Bar. It's Bloor and Ossington. Tickets are just $20. So come on in, and we have an insane panel. We've got the play-by-play -play radio announcer for the Blue Jays, Ben Shulman. We have the lovely friend of the show from MLB.com, Julia Cruz. And then we also have Twitter King the king of Twitter threads uh, and Sportsnet producer, Chris Black. We have our special guest, the Looney Dog Kings coming down. And yes, they are wearing the hot dog suits, Joel. 
And then finally, we're going to be doing a team roast battle. It is going to be the Oakland Athletics, David versus the Los Angeles Dodgers, Goliath. It's going to be a ton of fun, folks. And honestly, the best part about this show is chatting with everyone afterwards and like being able to express all this frustration in a safe space where we're all dealing with the same shit. <laughs> I was going to say alcohol. Yes. And alcohol. We all need so much alcohol to get through this blue Jays season. It is wild. So honestly, come on out. I'll post the, the ticket link in the comment section here. Come check it out. I remember like when it was Labatt's Blue Jays baseball, it's just, I think we need to go back to alcohol being our number one main sponsor just, just for the next seven years. Right. Yes. Just, just like you can really tie those things together. Uh, Blue Jays, they make you want to drink, you know, like it's, telecommunication it's, corporate entities just haven't done it for us recently. <laughs> we need to go back to those lovely nineties, early two thousands when we were, Brought to you by an alcohol company. Okay, the last comment will wrap things up here. The last comment comes from Kim's Dharma. And this was from our Friday episode when we were talking about Kevin Kiermeyer being put on waivers mid-game. And she says, putting Kiermeyer on waivers in the middle of a game was such a classless move. I'm embarrassed for this organization. And, I mean, it is a part of the game, obviously. Okay? And... Kiermaier did claim waivers. Shit, he hit a grand slam home run <laughs> uh, in that last game there before the All-Star break, which must have felt good for the guy who has just been hit with so much um, shit, I guess, is the best way of putting it. Rejection, right? I mean, this is a, this is a team that was basically like, dear Lord, anyone, please take us $4.5 million. Please, anybody. <laughs> Shocking to me that you couldn't get a buyer there. I was a little surprised too, just because of how good he is defensively, but maybe there's just teams. I Like this is one thing that I will say about the contending teams out there. You look at teams like the Yankees and they've done a good job of having a, a stalwart defensive outfielder on they've that Trent, team. Trent Grisham. They, to they do much have so Trent Grisham. Yeah. Exactly. So, <clears> I mean, <throat> Philadelphia, I felt like could have been a, a, a match there. But Philly is spending a, a shit ton of money, and maybe they have their high, their eyes on a higher candidate for the trade deadline. Who mm -hmm. knows? But, uh, yeah, I was a little bit surprised there. I know that uh, we were kind of tossing it around. Is this being overblown? Is this a thing? And there were lots of comments on both sides, just people who were like, this is part of the game. You're overblowing it's, it. I've, the, fun, the thing that I find kind of funny about it was Kiermaier coming into town last year, and I always thought that there's this element of our front office that is like, they're, they're jaded on players. They won't go back on previous mistakes and they won't communicate with teams that they feel like they're, they won't trade with Atlanta. It won't yeah. happen. They no. won't, he won't trade with Anthopolis. They won't do no. it. Right. And it's just like, that feels like, that feels like high school mentality. That feels like a child that feels very childish and, and very ridiculous. And and the one thing that I always looked at it was that it's like there are players out there that seem to represent Anthopolis that they kind of steer away from. And I was like, oh, Kevin Pilar, let's bring Kevin Pilar back. And they're like, no, let's bring Kevin Kiermeyer back for way more. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, there's isn't there like a loyalty thing? Didn't he make like the greatest catch we've ever seen? Isn't there something? He can still play center field. He can still go out there and get him. Oh, and now he's in... Anaheim playing like Mike Trout and you're yeah. like and and you're like you know who got him last year Anthopolis mm -hmm. Anthopolis brought him onto the Braves yeah right and you're just like it just you you just see a guy who's uh, uh, he seems I think Anthopolis would happily deal with the Blue Jays but no there's a there's a barrier there that says no you you don't like it so no. it's ego it is it's always been ego this, this front office has always had a hubris to them that has been detrimental for the organization. And I think you're really nailing, uh, really hitting the nail on the head here when you talk about the fact that they don't go back on their mistakes. Mm. Listen, we're humans. 
everybody makes mistake. And yes, baseball fans can definitely hold a, a mistake, uh, the feet to the fire when you make one. But being able to recognize a mistake and then prevent yourself from making the same sort of mistake down the road, th this is what a growing and a good front office does. And this is something that this front office has never shown us. To, to be taught by your losses. Which is why I think Teoscar is in LA and not Toronto. Yeah, but you, they didn't learn from their, their mistakes. They don't, like, there's, once again, once again, I am going to go to Moneyball. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between winning and losing. And I love to win, but I hate to lose. I hate to lose. And you have to hate to lose. You have, mm -hmm. It's not, I don't, I really don't think that you're trying to win. The best teams aren't trying to win. They're trying, they, they, they just, they hate losing so much. Winning is what happens, right? Winning is what, they go, okay, next one, next one. How do we not lose tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Right? It's not, it's, and, and, and it's like, well, no, no, teams, good teams are out there and they want to win. They don't worry about losing. They don't worry about losing. The players don't. The GMs do. The GMs do everything that they fucking can not to lose. And when you don't lose, you win. And I think that that is, and, and that's, that's what it is. And, and you have to, you have to, when it comes to me and my losses, they sit in my brain forever. They permeate my soul. I never forget my losses. I never forget my mistakes. They, they haunt me, you know, uh, Iron Man right? That's a fictional character, but Tony Stark always learns from his mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, Ant-Man gets into his costume and fucks everything up. So the next costume he makes is nanotech. So Ant-Man can't get in there. He's yeah. always learning from his mistakes. He's never going to make the same mistake twice. Right. And we're, we make the same mistake over and over and over again. Yeah. And then we never, we never go back and look at our mistakes and we never, and we can, yeah, you can fix it. Hey, can, hey can, uh, Otani signed uh, this deferred fucking thing. Uh, uh, Teo's there. We can sign a deferred thing. We go 15 million now and 10 million later. Oh, no, he signed that with the Dodgers. Yeah. We lost both of them. Yep. And now we're in a very shitty spot. This is, this is the reality of Toronto Blue Jays fandom. It's just there's no direction right now we're still not 100 percent sure what this front office is going to do we're not sure who is going to be at the helm by the start of next year we're not sure who's going to be the manager we're not sure who is still going to be in this organization as players it's not a fun feeling as a fan to have this little concrete um you know like this little we're the paper bag blowing in the wind, right? We're, we're directionless, directionless. We're, and we're, I guess we're so deep in the ocean. We don't know which way is up. We're so far into outer space. We, we don't just floating around in darkness. We for a will, long time. Maybe we will end the episode on that sombering thought. Uh, thank you all for all of your interaction throughout the week. We really do appreciate it. You can always reach out on Twitter at Walk Off Podcast, on Instagram, the Walk Off Podcast. If you are a Patreon member, a big thank you. You can always join Patreon. And by doing so, you get MLB Monday. So you get extra content. You get instant access to all of our interviews. And by the way, I did just sit down with former Toronto Blue Jay pitcher, Jesse Litch yesterday. He was great to talk to, buddy. Like, so much insight into player development because that's what he's been working in lately, right? He's been working in uh, with college kids, trying to get them drafted. And then just this year, he took a manager position with a collegiate league in Florida. So he's working with kids and stuff like that. Uh, that's great. That's on Patreon right now. I speak with uh, Brian Frank, who runs the Herd Chronicle in Buffalo. So we are going to get an update on all of the Buffalo boys and what we can look forward to uh, in the next year. Bisons that might be on the verge of making the call up. And we'll also really get to deep dive some of these guys like Stuart Baroa, who we're just starting to see the peak of here, peak their heads up and uh, get call-ups here and there. I know Stewart had his first major league start that last game before the All-Star break. And, buddy, his enthusiasm, I mean, I love it. 
It's infectious. It reminds me of Teoscar Hernandez and Lourdes Gurriel Jr. days. It, it's like the Barrio is back with Stewart in that dugout. It's awesome. All right. We'll wrap up there. Thank you so much to everyone. Take care of yourselves. We will see you Friday, and it will be Adam Mack as the co-host. The Mack Attack is back, baby. Excited for that. Take care and cheers.